So, I read a book. The Myth of the Rational Voter um, by Brian Kaplan. Brian Kaplan is a self-described anarcho anarcho-capitalist, libertarian, and uh, before I read this book, I actually read the criticism of this book, which is not optimal, but I just came across it and couldn't help uh, wanting to read it, and I read it. Uh, uh, it's a bit of an interesting story. The, the criticism was by Walter Block, who used to teach Brian Kaplan. And in one of his public speeches, Walter Block recognizes Brian Kaplan as one of his failures, as in he failed to raise, quote-unquote, Brian Kaplan as an Austrian economist. Uh, Kaplan is more of a neoclassical, um, somewhat mantraist, somewhat Chicagoite uh, economist. Uh, he's definitely not an Austrian. And, you know, I'm familiar with some of his critiques of the Austrian school, which I, I don't find persuasive. I, you know, I, I don't I don't see those critiques basically do not uh, convince me that uh, the Austrian school's views are problematic. But that's another story. So anyway, Walter Block critiques him with uh, uh, a bit of a zeal, you know. Um, it's a very emotional critique. And... Uh, I uh, I received advice from from one of my subscribers. Matt uh, told me that I need to. Well, he, he told everyone in one of his videos that uh, I think it was one of, his, one of his videos or one of his Facebook posts that we need to read the book. That the book is awesome. So I decided to get out and uh, go out and, and get the book, which I did, and I read it. Finally, I finished it today, and I can say, you know, um, after reading the book, I just now a few minutes ago I went back online and I I reread re the criticism. And I think that the criticism is disingenuous uh, by Walter Block is disingenuous in some parts, but with some of the major points that Walter Block makes, I actually have to agree. Um, so here it goes. Um, basically, why the book is interesting and what I learned from it, um, mostly is the concept of rational irrationality. That'll make sense in, men in a minute when I explain it. And uh, you know how it pertains to politics and democracy and voting and stuff. In short, the concept of rational rationality, irrationality, works like this: uh, people make people do irrational things knowingly um, because it pays to do so for them when they do it, or rather, they do it when it pays, uh, especially when the cost of being rational is low. Uh, compared to the cost of being rational, and the cost uh, costs are subjective, and in this particular case, we're dealing with psychic costs. What he means by that, I think, is a is a very valuable insight. People value clinging to their beliefs. People value um, having certain opinions, having certain certain views of the world, and that give them psychological comfort and make them feel good about themselves, feel smart, feel compassionate, whatever. Um, so, many times people act, for example, they vote based on certain views that upon closer examination will be revealed to be irrational. But it doesn't pay people to examine their views carefully and to find out that their closely held beliefs that give them such psychological comfort uh, things like, uh, and he, he lists those beliefs, those biases, that most economists, at least good economists, um, correctly perceive to be false, um, such as make work bias, as in prosperity means jobs, right? Uh, so the more more jobs, the better, uh, and uh, the less jobs, the worse. Um, Anti-foreign bias, foreigners are stealing our jobs. Uh, trade deficits are bad, imports are bad, things like that. Those are very real things, those biases. Um, and they do affect people's uh, voting behavior as, in, you know, as well as other behaviors. But the cost of voting on those biases, on those irrational, incorrect beliefs, uh, the cost to people is very low because the... the um, or rather, it's lower than uh, scrutinizing those biases 
and departing from them, giving them up. The discomfort, the pain of being challenged on your on, on beliefs that hold emotional value to you um, is very palpable, is very real, and people very often refuse to do it. Like they refuse to examine their beliefs because doing so means psychological pain. People feel threatened. Um, I don't need to go into this in, in any more detail. Uh, it's a very inter interesting topic that I suggest that you research for yourself. In fact, you should read the book. Well, should, should I don't know. You can read the book and discover for yourself uh, what it means. But I find that insight very valuable and very true. So Kaplan discusses democracy, the problems of, you know, constituencies, representation, what do politicians, what are politicians to do, are they to follow the will of the people, the will of the majority, even when that will is counterproductive or, you know, when the policies that the public likes are bad, which is, you know, most of the time uh, exactly, you know, the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I find that, that insight very interesting and worthy of examination. The problems I had with the book lie in how Kaplan characterizes certain beliefs and some of the sta statements that he makes about economics, about uh, economists in various schools of thought, and the manner in which he manages to avoid taking a stand on a lot of things. For example, he keeps referring to economists' consensus. Well, uh, as Walter Block correctly points out, in my opinion, on some very important issues, there is no consensus. In fact, there is a, a group of, you know, an, ad an identifiable group, a large block of people who are professional economists who hold views contrary to what Kaplan explicitly or, explicitly or implicitly characterizes as economic, you know, as a consensus uh, in the economics profession. Um, there are people, for example, that advocate minim minimum wage laws as beneficial to low-skilled workers. That's true. Okay. Um, Kaplan says, well, you know, economists, you know, any economist believes, no, not any economist believes that minimum wage laws do induce higher unemployment. Um, and that's an inescapable truth based in the nature of the law of demand. Uh, which is true, <laughs> okay, and and you know, you know, if you, if you study Menger, if you, st if you study like foundational Austrian economics, you understand very easily why it's true. But um, there are people out there who are economists, recognized as economists, you know, receive Nobel prizes as economists, and at the same time believe that minimum wage laws are not necessarily detrimental to the welfare of the workers, especially those skilled workers. Also. You know, Kaplan never says, I believe X or I believe Y. He always says, economists tend to believe mostly X or Y. So you wonder, like, okay, is there, like, one, one consensus in economics? Do you, Brian Kaplan, agree with that consensus? That's what's interesting to me, and he never, never goes there. Um, so he, he phrases this book very, very carefully, he phrases his positions very carefully. Well, not positions, but he, he phrases things very carefully at, uh, as to avoid taking a stand or expressing his own position at all, which sort of raised the flag a little bit to me uh, when I just first discovered it uh, like in, in the first section of the book. And he continued to do the same thing throughout the book, only towards the end, like in the last chapter, he starts talking about his own positions which can be characterized uh, or summed up as I favor more markets versus less markets. Okay, fair enough. So do I. But it gets more interesting. And not in a good way to me. Um, again, Brian Kaplan self-identifies as an anarcho-capitalist. Okay, he's, he's, he's said it publicly many times, and yet some of the things that he says in the book, it's kind of difficult to square or to reconcile with his professed um, uh, anarcho-capitalist position. I am an anarcho-capitalist. I think that any violent intervention by the state in the economic uh, processes 
uh, are harmful. Uh, but more importantly, one thing that he never discusses in the entire book, and that's kind of interesting, because he is writing for a layman. He's not writing for economists. Well, he sort of is and isn't. I mean, you know, like in one of the last sections of the last chapter, when he talks about what can we do to fight those uh, anti-market biases, the recipes that he presents are only applicable to teachers of economics, to economics professors. That's, that's okay, fine. Uh, so maybe he's writing to economics this this book for the economics professors, uh, teachers of economics. Fine, okay. If if that's his intended audience, well, that's his intended audience. He's uh, free to, you know, address his book to whomever he uh, he pleases, right? Um, but what was I going to say? Well, anyway, yeah, I'll move on to the next point. Uh, comes back, comes back. Uh, what was I going to say? Okay. He makes interesting statements in the book that sort of uh, call into question his uh, devotion to anarcho-capitalism. Like he, he will talk about tariffs, you know, how people may think, the general population may think, or the majority of the population may think that higher tariffs are good because they protect the industry or whatever, the domestic industries. And they talk, well, economic, the economists are actually not in favor of higher tariffs, and they, they can clearly see that higher tariffs are detrimental, that uh, the protectionism is bad for the economy, for the very people. Uh, these policies are supposed to protect, uh, meaning the population of a given country. But then he, he says, like, well, if we thought more like economists, and I, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't remember the exact wording, um, of that point that he makes, but if, if if people thought more like economists, they would like some like arrive at the understanding of an optimal level of tariffs. What? <laughs> optimal level of tariffs? So there's optimal amount of protectionism. Then, well, in my mind, if you're consistent, if 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 his position were to be consistent, the optimal amount of protectionism would be zero, and the optimal level of tariffs would be zero. He never says it. And again, if he, if he's writing for a layman then I think he ought to be more careful. Like, even if he, I, you know, I'm willing to concede, okay, it, it is possible he believes that optimal level of tariff is zero. He may be intentionally avoiding saying that, just coming out and saying that, in order to appear more objective. But given all those biases that he describes, wouldn't it be beneficial to fight against those biases by coming out more aggressively with, in, in stating your position? I don't know. Like, I don't see a good reason for an anarcho-capitalist to avoid saying that, well, actually, if you're consistent, if protectionism is, is indeed detrimental, then the optimal amount of it is zero. He doesn't say that. He just says optimal amount. Okay, well, so uh, the, the easy uh, conclusion from that phrase is that there is some kind of, some amount, some non-zero, some, some uh, amount of protection that is not zero, that is optimal. Interesting. It's I don't I don't know that he believes that, but the way he says it sort of leads you to believe that no, okay, you know, you might interpret what he's saying uh, to mean that there is some amount of protection that's actually good. Um, what else? Uh, oh, uh, you know, another interesting point, and I, I I saw it first, and I think Walter Block mentions it in his critique, but you know whether he does or not is you know doesn't matter. I'll mention it. Like, he talks about uh, regulating pollution from cars, I think. And he talks about, well, um, if we want people to drive less and to pollute less, you know, through driving less, then market mechanisms, you know, we shouldn't just go out and punish people for driving. Market mechanisms are far more efficient. We can just tax gasoline. And the market will work better. Well, what kind of market is that when you tax people? <laughs> what is that? Taxing is markets now? Brian, what are you saying? It is... It, look, he's a careful researcher and a very careful writer. He's actually a very good writer. So he knows what he's doing. Why would, he, why would an, an anarcho-capitalist want to say something like that in a book? Again, he... 
at the end of the book, he talks about how important the position of the teachers of economics is. Important because is important because they have they have the unique chance. to help cure some of the misconceptions against free economy. And yet he, he fails to do that. He has a perfect opportunity and he, he makes steps in the completely opposite direction by conflating or rather misrepresenting you know, a, a situation with a tax as a free market situation. That's, that's absurd and kind of disturbing to me. It's one example, but it's one of several, at least several. I'm, I'm not going to say many, but it's, it's, it's one of several. Uh, in the book. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah. The, the point that I sort of lost my train of thought on earlier was, he talks about government regulation uh, and uh, uh, in the economy, government regulation of the economy, without ever distilling or unpacking what that regulation means. That regulation, you know, any economic policy making with one exception that I'm going to talk about in a second, economic policy making consists of deciding how to use violence in economics. When the state intervenes, the state uses guns. He never mentions that fact. That's a pretty important fact, don't you think? Especially for an anarcho-capitalist who talks about government regulation, isn't it important to point out the not so obvious to most people, unfortunately, but you know the fact that should be should be should be made obvious to people that government regulation is about the use of deadly violence and threat thereof. This is no exaggeration. This is no exaggeration. Again, this point, you know this point, I, I'm sure, but well, maybe some of you don't. In fact, I shouldn't assume that you, you, you do, so I'll, re I'll repeat it. I've made it, I think I've made it before, but it bears repeating. Government is deadly force, okay? Taxation is deadly force. Think about what will happen if you consistently resist paying taxes. What is going to happen if you refuse to send in your money to the Treasury? If you say, I'm going to be a consistent uh, anarchist, and I don't, don't recognize your authority to take my property, I contracted to do some work, I was paid, you had nothing to do with it, I'm not giving you part of my earnings. Fuck you. Okay? What's going to happen? Well, it's going to be a progression of events. First, you're going to get a letter, then another, then probably another. Then you'll, you're going to start getting phone calls. But if you consistently ignore those, what's going to happen is an IRS agent is going to show up at your door. They're going to freeze your bank account, at least attempt to freeze your bank account, and they may t come to take your property, like, for example, take your house. What's going to happen then? They're going to ask you, well, let's say you've emptied your bank account and you're holding all of your um, assets in cash at home. They're going to come and attempt to take it. And if you refuse to let them into your house, what's going to happen then? We're talking about consistently resisting taxation, okay? What's going to happen is they're going to show up at your door again, this time with armed officers, maybe a local PD, maybe some feds, I don't know. But definitely, they're going to come and there are going to be people there with guns at your door. And they will start breaking it down. Okay, And if you resist them as you would any armed intruder who's trying to enter into your house without your permission, just imagine somebody comes to your door and starts knocking it down and they have a gun on their head and they try to enter into your house to take your stuff. What would you do? If, if they don't wear a uniform, what would you do? If you don't know that they're police, what, what would you do? You would resist. Well, you might call the police. Let's say they cut the line and they jammed your cell phone. You can't call the police. And you have a gun in your house, for example. What would you do? You would resist. And these people, we're talking about the uniformed people that came with the IRS agents to your door to forcibly take your property that you refuse to give them because you don't recognize their right to it, they will, they will shoot you dead. They will kill you in your house. And they will get away with it, too. They will be seen as legitimate by the majority of the population, certainly by themselves. So at the end of that progression, there's a gun, a loaded gun, pointed at your head if you consistently 
refuse to pay your taxes. That's, that's an example of what a government regulation is. Same, the same thing applies to the payment of tariffs or corporate taxes. The people with guns will come to take you away, to put you in jail, and to conf confiscate your stuff. And if you resist them, they will kill you. Okay? So consistent resistance, consistent resistance against the state taxing and regulating you spells death to the resistor. Okay? I think it's a pretty important fact. I think it's worth exploring, explaining to the reader that government regulation is actually backed by deadly force, by men with guns, sometimes women with guns. Never in his book does Kaplan mention anything like an explanation of what government regulation actually means. I think it's pretty important. I think it's a sort of a central concept for, for someone who calls himself, call himself an anarcho-capitalist to understand the nature of the state and the nature of state action. An act of state truly is an act of war because it's backed by the, by the threat of deadly force. Do not make the mistake of ignoring this fact. Like Stephen Molyneux likes to say, there's a loaded gun in the room. Every time you're dealing with the government, there's a loaded gun in that room. And if you ignore it, you ignore one of the fundamental aspects of the situation you're trying to describe or analyze. And that makes for poor analysis. So, you know, to talk about optimal government regulation, or moderate government regulation. Actually, Kaplan does talk about moderate government regulation. He mentions it. He doesn't say, I'm in favor of moderate government regulation. But for an anarcho-capitalist to even say, use a phrase, not quoting somebody else, by the way, not quoting some, somebody else, Walter Block ascribes certain positions to Kaplan that Kaplan did not state as his positions. He, you know, Kaplan deals with one particular research project, survey, comprehensive survey, and he deals with questions asked in that survey and positions explored in that survey. He, he, he cites those positions. He never says he holds those positions himself. And, and Walter Block incorrectly, I think disingenuously, ascribes those positions, positions to Kaplan. I don't agree with Walter Block in that aspect of his criticism. But, but, um, he does use the phrase moderate government regulation and he pretty clearly appears to be in favor of it. You know, it, it is very easy to make that conclusion from reading his text. That, again, is disturbing, because, like I just said, moderate government regulation is moderate use of the threat of deadly force. Interesting. Against non-aggressing individuals. Against people who are not using or threatening deadly force against anybody, who, is ju who are just transacting voluntarily with other individuals. That's pretty sick, okay? That's sick to a, to a consistent libertarian. That's sick. I don't have any other word for it. I'm not going to try to sweeten the pill. It is sick. And it's very disturbing to me that Kaplan would use a language like that. And there's other hints sort of uh, peppered, um, that, that pepper the book. Like, for example, he quotes economists right and left and center. He has some good quotes. He quotes... Uh, Bambavrik, for example, which is very, very rare to be for someone to be even familiar with the writings of Bambavrik and to quote him, um, and that was a favorable quote. Kaplan clearly, you know, came out in favor of what Bambavrik was saying in that quote. He quotes a lot of people, but the person he quotes the most, I didn't do a count, but I think if he did, clearly one economist that he quotes all the time would come out. Uh, in front, like way in front of everybody else in terms of the number of times it's quoted in that book, and that's Paul Krugman. Interesting. Paul Krugman is a self-described liberal, quote-unquote, and in, today, in today's uh, vernacular, political vernacular in the United States, that means pretty much socialist. Don't get me wrong. When Krugman's right, he's right. But why pick that particular person? I'm sure the, the positions... Uh, for which uh, Kaplan uses Krugman's quotes to back those positions up or to illustrate them, you can find other people to quote. Why pick that one? Well, okay, maybe there's an innocent explanation. Maybe he was so impressed with those several books by Krugman that he read or articles or whatever that he could not find any better quotes. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not 
sure I can go with the presumption of innocence anymore in this case. So by this point, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can understand, I'm, I'm a little pissed at Kathleen. So I think it's actually a political move on his part. He wants to appear non-biased. He wants to appear as mainstream as possible. And there's another flaw in the book. And I, I think it's, it's actually kind of, it's not nice at all. The cigar's going out, so give me one sec. He viciously attacks uh, Austrian economists, and that's kind of that's not nice at all. He talks there. There's a part in a book where he talks about market fundamentalism as a vice. Uh, uh, by market fundamentalism, he means a view that markets or the network of voluntary interactions, which is what markets means, uh, a view that the system of voluntary interactions is always superior in terms of uh, their outcomes of welfare for the participants of those interactions is erroneous. And he just bluntly comes out and says it, that it's an erroneous view. Let me quote. I, I don't want to be, I don't want you to uh, just go on what I'm saying. Let me quote the book. Okay. If neither the typical economist nor Milton Friedman himself qualifies as a market fundamentalist, who does? The only plausible candidates are the followers of Ludwig von Mises, and especially his student Murray Rothbard. The latter does seem to categorically reject the notion of suboptimal market performance. Such a view, that's the quote from Rothbard, such a view completely misconceives the view, the way, misconceives the way in which economic science asserts that free market action is ever optimal. It is optimal not from the personal ethical views of an economist, but from the standpoint of the free, voluntary actions of all participants, and in satisfying the freely expressed needs of the consumers. Government interference, therefore, will necessarily and always move away from such an optimum. I don't know about you, but I agree with this wholeheartedly. I, um, I think this is an entirely correct view. If you understand that optimal and suboptimal depend on the viewpoint, like there is no optimal, optimal uh, outcome. Optimal for whom? Okay, optimal for whom? And how do you decide? What's optimal for whom? Well, you can only decide what's optimal for you because value, again, is subjective. Value is subjective. Costs are subjective. Satisfaction or, or utility or whatever that we get from what we do, from economic and non-economic uh, interactions, um, or rather from material and, and, and immaterial interactions and transactions and actions that we take, is entirely subjective. You don't know. There's no way to look into another person's head and to determine whether they are you know, completely satisfied, partially satisfied, dissatisfied, and whatever. You don't know that. The only thing we, that we know about people is what they do and what they say. We know that people can be disingenuous and even, you know, sometimes not aware of what they're feeling or thinking, but we know what they do. We can see what they do. So you know, the whole notion of demonstrated preference uh, sort of goes there. Let me continue to quote from Kaplan after the M M Murray Rothbard's quote. Both Mises and Rothbard have passed away, but their outlook, including PhDs who, describe, who subscribe to it, lives on in the Ludwig von Mises Institute. But groups like these have basically given up on the mainstream economics. Members mostly talk to each other and publish in their own journals. The closest thing to market fundamentalists are not merely outside the mainstream of the economics profession. They are way outside. Okay, fine. You know, first of all, who said that, that, that the mainstream, however you define it, which he fails to do, is right. There's this assumption again that this consensus represents truth. You know, I don't know. The entire book is against democracy. And yet, somehow, he tries to sneak in, or rather, appears to try to sneak in this assumption that since most, you know, what most economists believe is a better truth than what, you know, fewer economists believe, what's that? Um, but also, it's, this is actually patently, uh, patently false on its face. How do you, you know, what do you mean by given up by mainstream on mainstream economics? Given up, as in, have written off their propositions, the propositions of what is called mainstream economics, which would probably be neoclassical economics. As incorrect, yes, they have stated many times, Austrians have stated that those positions are in fact incorrect, 
That is why Austrians hold different positions, because they believe that those positions are incorrect, okay? If that qualifies as given up, okay, well, you know, yeah, true. But that they only talk amongst themselves, that's, that's not true. First of all, there have been debates and interactions, a lot of them, between the Austrians and the non-Austrians. And hopefully we'll see more of that. Um, there are also instances where Austrian, Austrian economists challenge non-Austrians or you know, neoclassicals and on, you know, modern name Keynesians to debates like you know, the, the, the famous uh, Bob Murphy challenge to Paul Krugman who refuses to debate him and goes bananas when, when publicly challenged on a, on a radio show. I, I, I listened to a, uh, a recording of a radio show on NPR where a caller asked Krugman why he will not debate Austrians. And, and Krugman just went ballistic. He went through the roof. Um, when he became so completely emotional about this fact that it was, it was, it was quite hilarious and also sad at the same time. So the, the the statement that Austrians only talk amongst themselves, I th this is tr untrue, and Kaplan cannot be unaware of how untrue that is. I don't believe he's unaware. I think there's something going on there. I think there's some some personal uh, enmity or something. Maybe he's pissed at Bloch or he's pissed at uh, Austrians for for some reasons. I don't know. I don't know. But this is untrue and. You know, if you have a good explanation for why he would do that, please share because I'm I'm sort of lost and I'm kind of disappointed. Um, so just because again, at this point the Austrians are way outside means what they're wrong. <laughs> so so truth is determined by a vote now. Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, let me let me let me quote you another thing. Um, okay. Oh, okay. He's correctly attacking the pro-democracy bias. Like, people who are in favor of democracy are in favor of democracy regardless of whether the results that democracy brings are good or bad. It doesn't matter to them. Democracy is a good in itself, and it needs to be adhered to because it's a good in itself. And who cares about the results? Democracy needs to be supported because it's just it's the best. Uh, and, and we should stick with it. And he says that's fundamentalism, but you know, uh, nobody hardly ever calls people on that. Uh, they should because they call, they call people on market fundamentalism. But when you encounter uh, you know, a similar fundamentalism in favor of democracy, nobody gets called on that, that called on it, and that's that's bad. But listen to this. Uh, he quotes uh, a certain researcher who says, I remain an incorrigible optimist for the long-run healing powers of democracy, end quote. How many scholars would survey an expansive literature on market performance, admit that the evidence is too mixed to draw any conclusions, then speak of the long-run healing powers, uh, powers of capitalism? They would be too embarrassed, and should be. Oh, oh, so anybody who says that free market capitalism, free transactions between consenting adults, that ev the, the evidence of whether you know of how the application of this principle, you know, whether it's beneficial universally or not, that the evidence is too mixed. Any anybody who will be, you know, advocating that that's always good, should be ashamed of themselves. What? How do you square that with being an anarcho-capitalist? I'm sorry, it's just difficult for me. I, I you know, to reconcile these things. You know, again, if you have a good explanation for why he would write it in this manner, please share it with me because I don't, I don't get it. Okay, I don't get it. Look, uh, the way I see it, there are two alternatives here. Kaplan is either not an anarcho-capitalist, which then sort of leads me to the next question, why would he say that he is so many times? Or he is, but uh, he's willing to go on record lying about his beliefs in order to gain favors with the profession and to earn respectability? I don't know. If these are the choices, 
both of them are very, very bad. <laughs> okay? And it's sort of, sm you know, put, combine that with the constant quoting of Paul Krugman, and it sort of smacks of, of, of the Rand Paul scandal with the endorsement of Romney a little bit. I know these are not the same, but it, it just sort of jumped into my head. Like, uh, like you know that Romney is a scumbag, state a scumbag, and he, that, that Romney will, you know, without thinking twice, without batting an eye, will implement policies that run counter to what you believe in and what you feel very deeply about liberty and stuff, and I'm talking about Rand Paul, and yet you come out and endorse him anyway? Okay. A lot of people have a lot of problems with that, me included. So is that what Kaplan is doing? He's trying to um, earn some foothold, some place of respectability for himself, where he can not be attacked, because see, I'm, see, see, I'm, I'm judging these Misesians. Oh, those are, those are crazy fucks. You know, I'm not with them. I'm not like them. I'm, 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 I'm in favor of moderate government regulation. Modern government regulation can be beneficial. Hey, markets fail, right? Left and center. Um, and again, it's it's kind of he sneaks his assumptions into the phrases that he uses, like "oh, markets fail." According to whom? Compared to what? What do you mean fail? Fail as compared to some utopia of like perfect information or perfect competition? Well, okay, you can define anything any way you want. You can make anything sound like favor, uh, failure or success. But that's hardly, uh, you know, that hardly has educational value. If you just say, oh, your markets fail because information is imperfect. Okay, yeah. Information is imperfect not because of markets. Information is imperfect because of human condition. We do not have and can never have or will never have perfect information. That's just the nature of things, okay? But to say that, oh, since people, well, since people cannot fly, that's a market failure. Well, people cannot fly because of some very real physical limitations. We don't have wings. You know, if we flap our arms, we're not going to generate enough lift to get off the ground, blah, blah, blah. You can say that that's imperfect from a standpoint of someone who believes that people should be able to fly. Okay. Well, from the standpoint of, of someone who believes that people should have perfect information, uh, real-world market competition is imperfect. Uh, uh, real-world uh, distribution of information is imperfect. Okay, fine. It's imperfect. So what? So what? Does he not understand that by saying that, he implicitly, but very powerfully, advocates government intervention. And again, he fails to explain that government regulation is a gun, a loaded gun pointed at somebody's head. At somebody who's innocent of any wrongdoing whatsoever. I don't know. I'm very disappointed. I don't understand what he's doing. With the book. But this attack on the Mises Institute and the the constant attempts to distance himself from, you know, market fundamentalists, it's a little bit shameful. And to me, like, w good job, Brian. Way, you know, great, great way to distance yourself uh, from, from a from this group. Okay, fine. What have you achieved, though? I know what you achieved for yourself. I can guess. If that's your motive, Brian. I, you know, I'm disappointed. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. I may be completely wrong about this. Okay, I may be missing something very important that would explain all this. You know, all of this away, or explain it in such a way as to make clear how you can be a market you know, uh, anarcho-capitalist and believe these things or write these things. So, but, you know, uh, my impression as things stand right now is kind of meh. You know, I, I don't know. Read the book. There's a lot of great insights in it. Um, in fact, if you're in New York City, area, greater New York City area, I can, I can lend you my copy uh, if you want. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. On some of the things, Walter Block is wrong in his criticism of the book. In some other things, he's, he's unfortunately right. Um, read the criticism and read the book. Read the book, too. You know, don't rely on what I'm saying. Find out for yourself. N you know, none of the things that I mentioned invalidate his other insights. 
They don't. But the fact that he never calls into question the existence of the state itself, he just discusses how to run it. Okay? He, he, he proves very convincingly that democracy leads to bad policies, bad for the people who vote, bad for the con constituents of uh, politicians. But he never discusses the nature of the state itself. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of important to do. Again, policy making with the exception of dismantling regulation, and thereby increasing freedom, restoring freedom, Policy making consists in deciding where and how much violence to use against non-aggressing people. That's what policy making is, and he discusses it like it's nothing, like it's playing golf or something. Like you know, a dispassionate observer just you know discussing oh policy, policy making this, policy making that. We could be making policy this way, or we could be making policy that way. Where the, the fact itself of making policy, the act of making policy, is violence, is despicable. And harmful, you know. I believe praxeologists are true. I believe that at least ex ante, uh, I mean, ex, uh, yeah, ex ante, uh, people do expect to benefit from free actions. Otherwise, they wouldn't be taking those actions. So, Rothbard's statement is actually correct. Uh, and for for Brian Kaplan to dismiss it like uh, completely, you know, out of hand, saying, "Oh, this is way outside of me. It's way outside of mainstream," and Im Expli implicitly, not explicitly, but implicitly say, I'm with the mainstream. Come on, I'm with the mainstream. I, I think these guys are way out there. This is like, this is this is crap. This is nonsense. So we don't, we economists, we respectable economists don't think like that. They're, these people are a cult. They, you know, they just talk to themselves or each other and they don't, they, they publish in each other. They publish in, in their own journals. Yeah, yeah, they do. They had to set up their own journals because other journals, existing journals, will not, would not publish them. <laughs> How's that? Jesus Christ, that's, that's just so, so not nice of Brian Kaplan. Anyways, enough ranting.